Hello, everybody, and welcome to the State Library of Victoria. Uh, it's a thrill to be hosting tonight's Salon Series, um, which is the first of 2022 and the first without masks. So there you go. And tonight's event is hosted by the Wheeler Centre and the State Library of Victoria. And as you know, the Salon Series celebrates some of the most exciting thinkers, writers and performers at work today. I'm Fiona Gruber, an arts journalist, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the fact that we're on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. Now, tonight's salon title, the theme of the evening is Fighting Form. But maybe in these commentative times, I might rephrase that and see our guests as skilled sculptors of form, maybe, playful rearrangers, people who are experimenters, colouring outside the lines. They include the fantastic one-man band soundscape artist, Great Earthquake, who we'll be hearing from at the end of tonight. And before that, I'm very much looking forward to chatting with Michelle de Kretzer about her extraordinary new novel, Scary Monsters. I'm assuming that many of you here will have read the book. If not, you've got a wonderful treat. Um, but as you can see from this book, it is, um, has two covers. You have, do, you have to do this. Ah. I've, I've done this often enough. <laughs> it, keeps, <laughs> it keeps toddlers amused for yes. minutes. <laughs> You're feeling sleepy, very sleepy. Um, now, depending on where you start in this novel, we could find ourselves following... The story of Lily, a young woman living a very vivid time in Montpellier, in France, in 1980-81, as a young assistant. And um, it culminates, I'm not giving away too much, with the election of the first socialist president of France, Francois Mitterrand, a time of great hope. Or, if we start reading it on this side, we could be following the life of Lyle, and you'll find yourself in Melbourne in the near future, a Melbourne that's quite dystopian, um, but which Michelle explores in exquisite satirical detail. So my first question, Michelle, which is probably the first question of everybody who interviews you, is what were your reasons for writing the novel in this form? Thank you. Yes, we do have to talk about the form. Um, well, look, I had lots of reasons, some to do with content and some to do with form. Um, so just to take content first, both Lily and Lyle are Asian immigrants to Australia, um, even though Lily has now finished universities and is um, working in Europe. And... When I think about migration, I think of it as a process that really turns lives upside down. So I wanted this form, the form of the novel, to embody the meaning of the novel. Um, and so that was one, one reason for doing it, the sort of main reason uh, as far as content goes. Um, uh, various other things, but, but that's the main one. Um, and then, as far as form goes, well, uh, over the course of my last couple of novels, I've been trying to, to play with the, with the novel as a form and to see, um, you know, how much you can kind of um, stretch and um, disrupt the form of a novel, um, which, you know, when we think, what is a novel? Uh, I think we would think, well, it's, um, it's a continuous narrative with unity of, of tone, of style, and so on. Um, and in my last novel, I had um, five discrete sections, each of them focused on a different character, but there was one character who went you know, all the way through. So this time I wanted to just take it that one step further and um, have, see what he could do with a novel that, that was, instead of being a continuous narrative, was, was two radically 
discontinuous narratives, because that is also to do with migration, isn't it? It's a, it's a, disrupt, it's a disruption of the story. So um, I had, um, you know, a novel that, I mean, a, a narrative that's set in the past, a narrative that's set in the future, and because they're both told in the first person, they have to sound very different because Lyle and Lily are very different characters. Um, so I guess it was this attempt to see how far, how far can you go with breaking a novel? Well, you really do push the boundaries here. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, you know, the thing about form, the thing about form is um, that it functions like armor. You know, it, it's something that constrains your movements, but it also protects you. So when you break form, you are taking a risk, you're leaving yourself exposed, and, you know, um, this is a book that gives a lot of agency to readers, I think, and asks readers to make sense of this novel. And, you know, you can either see something broken and think, well, that, that opens up something new, the possibility of something new, or you can just see something broken. And, of course, um, a writer, a reader, immediately wants to make connections, yeah, wants to find yeah. links, echoes, but... But which to... is good. I, I like that. I mean, I think, you know, that I mean, humans, we want to, as, as humans, we are hardwired to, to make sense of stuff. And so I think what this um, novel does is that it puts in the reader's hands a lot of um, meaning making. So there are um, some unconsciously that I put in this novel and some consciously sort of um, um, little um, shared images or glimmerings between the two halves of the novel. Um, and readers will will find those or not. Um, so I mean, and some readers have told me, oh, you know, oh, so yeah, I really I connected that in the Lily story with that in the Lyle, and I hadn't intended that at all. But it's there, and I love that that people are are making you know making a novel for themselves. And I mean, I think the thing is that with any novel, even one that's completely conventional. Every novel exists in uh, an infinite num number of forms. You know, there are, there are as many novels, as many versions of a novel as there are readers. Um, we all have a different idea of Madame Bovary um, or Emma. Um, and it changes when you read it again. And it changes when you read it again. So I really like the idea of, you know, um, readers putting this book together from its, from its two parts and um, coming up with something different from, you know, what I had in mind. And did you decide to do, have this structure before you started writing? No, but, but um, oh, you, well, I, the structure, yes, but the upside down thing, no. F um, fairly, but it came fairly early on. I had it as a possibility in my mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, two, the sort of the, the broken book um, idea I had from the start of the, um, you know, discontinuous thing. Partly because I thought, well, you know, it really is, if it's, if it's going to be focused on migrant voices, you know, migration changes the story. So I wanted that readers to, who may or may not be immigrants to experience that at a sort of um, micro level and fleetingly, you know, oh, what's going on? The story has changed. But the, um, the upside down bit, um, I mean, I was nervous about that. <laughs> yeah, how did you, did, when you had that first conversation with your publisher? Uh, yeah, well, that was an interesting. So I said to her, um, oh, you know, so I've, I've got this novel, um, sort of, you know, doing last revisions. And um, I'm thinking, I w you know, I've got a sort of idea for the way it would be published, which is, which is different. And as I was speaking, I could see the fear rising, <laughs> rising, rising in her eyes. And she looked at me and she said, <laughs> she said, 
said, do you want to publish it in a box? <laughs> Is that the, 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 the refuge of the experimental novel? Yes. So, and you know, I'm sure some of you might have read that novel by B.S. Johnson, which was published, you know, loose leaf in a box, and then um, readers could just sort of read it, it in any order they, they wished. Um, and so after I had said, no, I didn't want to publish it in a box, there was such relief there that I could have sort of asked for. So they said, oh, we, we can have page numbers, so that's OK. Yeah, we have page numbers. We will have a fixed order, um, so that's OK. Then the other interesting discussions were actually awful lot of time spent on barcodes. Where do you put the barcode? Okay, traditionally on the back of the book, but there is no back to the book. Is a barcode allowed to go on the spine of a book? This was the subject of many meetings and had to be approved. I don't know who by the barcode regulator. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. So. Um, the Brits have done the same, barcode. No, the Brits have, because it's, of course, it's hardback. Of course, you know, you can't do literary fiction. That's not hardback. So I think they've got it on a flap, I think. Um, and then the Americans, really annoyingly, that's, they also have hardback. But my publisher, who's um, a sort of smaller publisher, is distributed by... Um, Penguin Random House, I name and shame, because they refused to distribute a novel that didn't have a barcode on the back. Oh. They just refused. And the thing about America is everything is bigger, including the barcodes. They are gigantic. They are just absolutely gigantic. So what we came up with there for the Americans was that half the print run would have the barcode on you know, the lily side and half on would have it on the Lyle side. I can see your next novel might be called Bar. Bar. <laughs> on one side and I the just, other. But, you know, you don't think of... This is how marketing kind of, you know, really uh, uh, has an influence on, on aesthetics because, uh, really, this was, this was a, a debated question, the barcode. Mm. So which did you write first out of interest? Lily, Lily, um, absolutely Lily, because... Um, so the other thing with this novel that I hadn't really done before was that they're both um, first-person narratives. And I think with my second novel, I do have a first bit of it as first-person narrative, but it's about... Mm, it's probably about, you know, um, I don't know, a fifth of the book or something. Um, and I've always been a bit nervous of first person. Uh, I know this is weird because a lot of writers begin with first person. Well, isn't that right? why it's seen as slightly more juvenile form in some odd pecking order? Yeah, maybe. Maybe because you know I used to work for Lonely Planet and uh, I was publishing a travel literature series there, and so you know travel literature is always told, uh, travel narratives always first person. Um, and I was trying to distance myself from that. And also, I do think um, the moment you have first-person narrative, um, people just assume that it is straight um, autobiography, which really annoys me because, you know, I make stuff up. And I sort of want credit for having made stuff up. Um, but there's such a fear of the imagination, I think, you know, and it goes back to Plato, of course, you know, banishing poets from the Republic. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so I kind of shy away from that. But, I mean, there are um, autobiographical elements in, in both these, both halves of the, the, the novel. And, of course, I was in Montpellier in 1980 to 81, um, but, and I know there's someone here who uh, was in Paris at the time that I was in Montpellier, visited me in Montpellier. Um, but she will, I hope, um, go along with me when I say that there are, you know, there are um, elements that are taken directly from my experience there. I mean, certainly all the political stuff. Um, and then certain things, but, but there are elements um, that have been configured differently. So um, 
two characters in the novel, um, Nick and Minna, live in the apartment that I actually lived in. Um, but, you know, Lily doesn't live there. So, Lily, Lily yeah. lives in her exquisite but hideously cold yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. historical centre flat. And there are certain things. So, you know, I mean, I, I did have a landlord who, when my shower started giving off electric shocks and I rang him, um, you know, sort of saying, yeah, my shower is giving off electric shocks, he sort of looked at me and said patiently, um, well, you know, don't take showers. Um, <laughs> this is sort of so easily solved. Um, so, you know... I remembered that, and I thought, that's got to make its way into the book. But mostly it is just, it is imagined. But, you know, the first person, um, yeah, does create this effect. And I think, you know, I'm writing certainly in the Lily section, but also in like, basically realist fiction. And, the, you know, the reality effect. I know you said to me, Fiona, when we were talking, um, you know, all the stuff, you know, there's all this stuff about clothes, because one of the characters... Um, Mena is, um, you know, sort of a fashion junkie. Um, and uh, you said, oh, and maybe this was, you know, I thought maybe that was um, autobiographical. Well, that is entirely made up. Oh, really? Because I, I felt like I could recognise certain clothes items that you used to wear, you know. I thought, <laughs> right. that, that was what Michelle was wearing in 1980. Interesting, before I knew her. <laughs> I mean, you, you are a wonderful stylist. Michelle, you, you have this pitch-perfect ear, I think, in your love of language and just getting exactly the right phrases. But I did think, what if you'd written Lily as a satire and Lyle yeah. as a piece of, You know, did you... Was that... You know, how would you go about that? Oh, um... I don't know. Um, I guess with Lyle, I wanted it... I mean... The, the reason I, because, because it's set in the future, uh, and I was aiming for this kind of, you know, German expressionist um, kind of effect of, well, sort of, it's satire, but it's more than satire. It's, it's kind of a, it's a sort of, um, it's grotesque, it's the grotesque, really. So a bit um, of a, like an Otto Dix painting. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, that stuff that's almost caricature, but isn't quite. Um, and um, so it would have been harder, I think, to, to because it's set in the future and this was sort of what I was imagining it would be like, um, harder to move away, to, to, to get that in talking about the past and about Lily when you know what, I mean, every reader knows what has happened. Mm. But it's interesting, I find, that, um, you know, you've, you've got... This character, uh, Lyle, and you're, it's, it's interesting how satire is very close to disapproval in a sense that one can't, you know, can one have approving satire? Sure, it, it is about undermining and pricking the conceits. Well, I think, you know, um, yeah, traditionally, you know, it, uh, what are the aims? You know, satire takes aim at, at folly, at, at uh, greed, at pride, at cruelty, at power, basically. Um, I mean, you know, a satire that's directed as the, at the powerless would be horrible, really. Um, well, yes, I mean, except, of course, it has been done. I mean, it's... We should really talk about content a bit, because the title, Scary Monsters, mm. I mean, yes, it's a song by David Bowie, but it's actually the scary monsters of this novel are many-headed, aren't they? Yeah. Islamophobia, um, misogyny, violence, uh, ageism, um, which is something I'm really interested in. This and, and the, you've you've got this world. You've got this world of La, which is post-pandemic. It's a little bit in the future. It's but it's a sort of near future, and it's not as though everyone's walking around in. A, it's, there's nothing science fiction about it. It's no, very no. much. A very close sort of facsimile of the present, but just, you know, taking things a little bit further, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, 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 the screw just given another turn. Well, the reason for that was um, that, you know, if you're reading about a world that is really different from your own, then it is easy to say, well, our world is not like that. And what I was hoping for with this novel was to say, well, our world could very easily become that. So, 
you know, there couldn't be too much, um, you know, gadgetry that was, you know, strange technology or, or, or anything that would make the reader feel this, is, this world is completely alien from mine. Um, well, yes, you have, you have this world, this Melbourne, that, where there's a permanent pool of smoke yeah. over it, where 50 degrees day, days are the norm, where people wear masks as a matter of course, and also where euthanasia of the elderly is something that has, in a very bureaucratised world, it's the least bureaucratised element. Getting Shuffling off the elderly is seen as something that's, you know, a cleansing part of society. Well, you know, I started writing this before the pandemic, right? And then what did we see with the pandemic? You know, you know, people like Andrew Bolt saying, why are we having a lockdown? I mean, it's only old people who are dying. This is not a dangerous disease if you are young. Um, and you know, it's just I'm sitting at my computer thinking, yeah, you know, you write it and it comes true. It's... Um, but which is not surprising because, you know, the, um, I mean, if you think of something like the aged care um, sector, that has been, um, I mean, you know, it's sort of um, underfunded and, um, I mean, underfunded is an understatement, um, just sort of um, very, very badly run, uh, forgotten about, really. Um, for the last 15 or 20 years, so you can see you could see this stuff coming, really, um, and it, and it still is. Um, you know, why does Richard Colbeck have a job? He really should not. Um, well, none of them should have a job, really. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, only, only a report <laughs> yesterday said that more people probably died from COVID in aged care through mismanagement from the, the, the actual disease, disease. I mean, it was yeah, just so badly yeah, organised. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, John Howard, thank you for that, because uh, he, he did that as well. You know, getting rid of the notion of, you know, being sort of nursing home and, uh, yeah, just aged uncare. Mm. The characters in Lyle, I want, I'll go back to Lily in a moment, but the, car, the characters in Lyle... Lyle himself, his, his wife Chanel, their children Sydney and Mel. Yeah. And not to be confused with the children of, of uh, her boss who are called Siri and Alexa, which <laughs> I thought would. I thought you could, you could, you could, you were probably dying to introduce a few more children and you know, <laughs> just to play with their well, name. You know, the thing is, because it's so Lyle, the thing about Lyle is he's quite a, you know, he aspires to perfect blandness. Um, but fear at the root of it. Yeah, isn't fear it? at the root of it, but through that, um, because he's afraid, he wants to be, you know, he wants to pass under the radar to, to sort of blend in and pass unnoticed. Um, and so he's, you know, he, he, I'm trying to find a voice for this man who, he, who wants to pass on notice and who wants to be, um, wants to be sort of mediocre, sort of perfectly mediocre person. But a perfectly mediocre Australian. A perfectly mediocre but, Australian. With slogans like, how great is Australia, no question mark. Um, and that sense where, you, you know, people fetishise um, real estate, uh, you know, and debt is seen as a really kind of patriotic thing to have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so I had to find ways of sort of trying to, well, uh, inject some, some um, verb into Lyle's language and narrative. Um, so one way of doing that was through some names, which... So in Lyle's world, um, not everyone, but several people have names that are brand names, like Prada or Porsche. So which is also, you know, to suggest the, um, the kind of the ruthless um, consumerism of, of Lyle's world, where this has spread out into society. Um, but also Lyle's, um, Lyle's idiom, is, has been infected by marketing. So he will say that someone is as reliable as a Toyota. Um, so, you know, he, the, the, the language of marketing has become 
his own personal discourse. But that's because, partly, he has deracinated himself completely, hasn't he? He has stripped away the past. I mean, in other novels, objects have a talismanic quality. Yeah. And yet the, the, he has purposely got rid, and his wife, Chanel, got rid of all talismans because they could mark you out. They could betray you in yes. some way. Yes. And that's in contrast to his mother, the wonderful Ivy, who I'd like to sort of explore a little bit because she's an elderly woman and she is the most fully rounded. She, she carries her past, her fascinating past, in another country, married to um, you know, a poet and a, a filmmaker, going with a filmmaker to villages and remote parts. She's flamboyant, she's opinionated, she's incredibly rude when she wants to be. She upsets the apple cart. And she reminds me of other characters, Iris, for instance, or you know, in your other books. Tell us about your use of the, the... Of course, in one sense, they're characters, they're vivid characters, but your elderly women are saying something in each of the, the novels they appear in. Even though they're different characters, they share certain qualities, certain kind of motivations or impulses. Well, I think that, in, you know, generally speaking, elderly women are, the, uh, are treated with contempt in society, unless they're very rich, of course. Um, you know, that's different. Um, but they tend to be overlooked and disregarded. Um, and I want my elderly women to have, have a presence in my fiction and to talk back. But she's a bridge as well, isn't she? she she's a, in a world in the near future where it's dangerous to be foreign. It's dangerous to, especially to be possibly, you know, to be Islamic, to be Asian. Mm -hmm. um, she is a bridge that is openly celebratory in her kind of in her in her culture but very individual as well isn't she yeah yeah but i mean lyle for that reason has to you know reject her because she does stand for the past and he sees australia as being a country that um isn't too keen on examining um its past, and so that the ideal Australian, excuse me, in his view, is someone who is, you know, future-facing and um, doesn't spend too much time at all thinking about the past. So, uh, you know, he doesn't want to really uh, spend too much time thinking about uh, Ivy. I really like your comment when uh, he is the, the dinner party, the wonderful dinner party for Chanel's boss and... Uh, her, his, hus his wife, who's a real estate agent, and he talks about that they, they cook Thai food. But, and, you know, they're used to people saying, oh, we didn't know you had Thai, you know, cultural heritage. And they always say, no, we're Australian, so we like ethnic food. Yeah. And we make, the, and this is our ethnic food of choice, with the proviso that they would never dream of cooking the food from the culture they're actually from, because that would be, he says, as awful as wearing national costume. And you might end up in a kind of a two-dimensional, um, you know, freeze on a wall somewhere. And then he makes the comment, have you ever seen a Dane in one of those ethnic <laughs> costumes? And like, no, you know, the <laughs> other ring is always a non-European yeah. other ring. Yeah, yeah, as someone with a Swedish past, Fiona, this must have spoken to you. Well, a Hungarian, you know, but, but you know, I get, a, get away with it, don't I? Yeah. Of course, I'm, you know, got those dyed fair locks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this, this, this racism, of course, and, and sort of fear of not fitting in is something that Lily is also exploring. I, that other friend where she's talking to Rinaldo, Rinaldi, isn't it? Her, very creepy neighbour, and she explains that she comes from Australia, and that it's a multicultural country. And he says, "Ah, oh, I'm Pei Poubelle, a garbage country." Yeah, I've, I've heard someone said that to me in France. You know, a, fr a French person naturally uh, said, "Ah, oh, yes, Australia. That's you know this this uh, rubbish bin country because you know you take people from all over the world." Which, of course, France does too. Although on its own terms. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, sort of the irony is that someone, you know, called Rinaldi has obviously got Italian origins, for instance. 
Um, but, you know, no, there's just pure Gallic stock. Mm. But of course, Lily, Lily is also commenting the fact that she's a young woman uh, from an Asian background in fr via Australia in France. So she's, she's got facets to her. Um, but people in both sides of the novel are always trying to deny people the individuality and agency of being a person. You're only allowed to be a full person if you're kind of Anglo-Celtic, it seems, or Danish, possibly. But, um, but Lily, of course, is, you know, the, one of the other themes in the book is how you negotiate the world as a woman. You, we've talked about aging women um, and Asian women, sort of youthful women like Lily. The, the, that sense of fear in everyday life when you're negotiating a world where people could jump out and, uh, at you from the shadows. And of course, 1980, 1981 was a time of the Yorkshire Ripper, and mm. that figures. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of, uh, some of Lily's fear is just sort of uncertainty about the future because, you know, so she's finished university, she's working at this job that's going to last a year. So she doesn't know what she's going to go on and do. Um, so you know, it's, I wanted to capture that sort of moment um, between um, university and working, your working life, and, you know, which is a sort of exciting stage where, mm, you know, all sorts of things are possible, but also a rather unnerving stage where you, you really don't know what the future is going to Hold. Um, and so there's that, which, you know, makes her anxious. Um, and then also, you know, being, being this young woman in, in a world where, you know, men are quite predatory. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because my publisher who, who, you know, has spent, um, you know, has, has not only ever lived in Australia was saying to me, oh, well, you know, as a young woman, I remember, you know, in my 20s, the, the advice was always, you know, have your, have your keys handy. And I think, well, it's, I mean, for me, I, you know, keys means car keys, really. I only, have a, only ever had a door key because I didn't have a car until, I didn't drive until, you know, um, so it was about 25, I think. And living in France, um, most people I knew just didn't drive. Everyone, you know, used public transport at, of, of that age. So, uh, you know, there was not that, there, there wasn't that sort of culture of, you know, carry your keys. And it was just, I think the culture was just run. If someone attacks you, run. Scream, run. Um, hmm. Yeah. It's because, I mean, was the Montpellier that you described, that, I mean, I know it's not autobiographical, but, you know, you talk about going to the cinema, it was a long way away. Yeah. All these sort of journeys that Lily has to negotiate and her friend Mina, um, they're also trying out personalities, they're, you know, fearless ones, and your, um, your, your obsession in the novel with Simone de Beauvoir. Was that one you, um, you had at the time yourself? No, I didn't really. Um, Lily is sort of, you know, much uh, smarter than I was um, and braver as well. But um, I do remember the thing of, you know, Simone de Beauvoir as a young woman was sent off to um, teach in Marseille. Uh, that was her first job after, out of uni. Um, and when I was in Montpellier, I remember remembering that, and that she used to go for these long walks in the hills um, outside Montpellier, outside Marseille, where she didn't know, because she didn't know anyone, and she would be lonely on the weekends. Um, and that, you know, teachers at her school say to her, be careful, be careful, you know, you'll be raped. And she just says, no, I will not be. I refuse to be scared. And you know, I will do these things because I, 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 you know, I want to. It is my right to be able to do this. Um, and so Lily, remembering that, is trying to emulate it. But Lily is frightened. Um, but she does do it. She is brave and she does walk um, by herself at night. Um, and, yeah. So, so 
that idea of the young woman inventing herself, creating a persona that makes her braver, um, you know, a young feminist also who's aware of a kind of a literary world that she's part of. I mean, it's in, also interesting, I think, that Camus' L'Etranger is also there in the sense yeah. that Arab, young North African men who make passes at her and, and, and she, she avoids... Uh, because she doesn't want to have passes made at her from anybody. Um, you know, he is... Uh, that, the character um, in, in, uh, in that book kills an Arab on a beach, but in fact is more condemned for the fact that he doesn't show uh, remorse at his yeah. mother's... He doesn't cry uh, at his mother's he, funeral. He doesn't cry at his mother's funeral. That's seen as a greater crime than just randomly killing an, an Arab man on a beach. And so there's an echo there. Isn't there sort of a mention of that, sort of an echo in Lyle's word and his, world and his lack of, or seeming kind of lack of um, empathy for his mother when he's sort of contemplating shuffling mm. her off. Yes, and of course, also the link with the Islamophobia um, in Lyle's world. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is quite striking. Um, you know, I, I did French at Melbourne Uni, um, and we, we studied, of course, um, oh, actually, I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, we did study, we studied a lot of Camus, but I think I did actually L'Etranger, um, The Outsider, I think it's is, is it translated as The Outsider or The Stranger? Anyway. I think The whichever. Outsider in the Penguin edition, it was called. That, well, the light green spine that I remember. Um, but, you know, no one, I don't remember anyone, any teacher at school or at university, actually drawing our attention to the fact that Merceau, The Outsider, is a Frenchman living in Algeria. I mean, he's sort of, you know, he's... French Algerian, and um, you know what were the French doing there? The whole we were always taught this book in terms of Camus' style, which is radical. You know, he he was the first person to not use the simple past in 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 a, a literary novel, which was you know breaking. He was fighting form. He broke a very um, fundamental rule of French style in using the. The, the, a, a different past tense, which is usually just for spoken, um, the spoken language. And, you know, so we studied it, studied it in terms of style, we studied it in terms of existentialism, um, the philosophy of the absurd. But this nameless Arab who is shot on a beach was just just somehow never, never, never figured uh, in any conversation. Oh, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? It is, and, and Lily picks up on this in the novel because she thinks, well, no one actually ever cares about the Arab, yet she identifies with the Arab. The Arab who never has, a, who doesn't even have a name. He's the Arab. Um, and, you know, everyone, of course, identifies with the stranger and and feels the injustice of his condemnation. Well, yes, and that, that dehumanisation is something that, I suppose, you know, the echo of that literary dehumanisation is, is picked up in the complete sort of dehumanisation of people in this near future, yeah. where to appear more Australian, um, Lyle plays a game called whack a Muller. Which yeah. I'm not quite sure how it actually manifests no, itself. I don't <laughs> but, you know, as someone, a, another interviewer described you as an equal opportunity satirist, <laughs> yeah. and that you have a go at the sort of, you know, eco fascism, 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 <laughs> you know, Islamophobia, racism, sexism, etc. You know, you are yeah. skewering all those things. But, um, yeah, you know, those sort of echoes from one part of the novel to the other. Um, I'm interested in the fact that, lot, as you say, lots of people pick up on aspects that you yourself didn't realise you were actually incorporating. Yeah. Do you, do, you, um, do you always confess to that, or do you think, no, I think I'll own that one. I'll just say, yes, I, I do. No, no, I do. I do say, you know, to people, yeah, that, oh, I hadn't, hadn't seen that, but, yeah. 
But it's interesting, I, do, I mean, that, that people are sort of analysing these things and maybe seeing connections that, that you don't. I mean, the thing I was, one of the things I was really fascinated in as well is the way you describe location. You, and you contrast that, the Montpellier, and the romantic idea of it with what seems quite a hideous Melbourne of the future and the outer, outer suburbs. And yet, actually, you're sort of saying the opposite of what your your characters are saying, in the sense that Lily wants to live an authentic French life in a, the historic centre of the city, because she's seen a photograph of a young woman bathing at an open window of the shutters, and it all looks so wonderfully sort of French and romantic yeah. and a little bit erotic as well. And of course, her historic centre is a kind of disnification in a way, it's, and hideously uncomfortable. Mm. But then Lyle's is, uh, you know, what seems very bland and plastic is actually somewhere that he's very comfortable in. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that there is a sort of democracy in suburbia of, you know, people feeling safe, feeling being well-fed and, um, you know. But did you, did you know the world of... I mean, you obviously knew the world of Lily because you'd been there, and although obviously you made loads up, that you, you could actually draw on memory and also draw on, you know, other references and research. Whereas, how did you go about just sort of creating the, the Lyle's world? Or is it already... Is it you just went to certain places you, or you just... Ah, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think I went to some sort of outer suburbs and looked at the kinds of houses that you find there. Um, but, you know, I made stuff up. I just... Yeah. But you, you, you <laughs> tap into the anxiety of, not, of, of having an address that is, just doesn't pass muster. Your character say, well, you know, senior... I, I've realised that as a person in senior management, I shouldn't live here anymore. Yeah. You, you, you have that... You, you're tapping into that Australian, I'm not just Australian, but, but the, our obsession with where we live and what we own. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, don't you think... Well, I mean, there, there is an obsession, isn't there? Well, the, Real the, estate and... Yeah, I mean, you, you're, you're, you're Australia of the near future. Um, yeah, how far did you have to tweak it? How much did I have to tweak it? Well, not much, I don't think. Um, did you have to pull back? Did you start, did you <laughs> abandon things that were just too... <laughs> oh, maybe one or two. <laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> yeah. Do you like your characters? Tell me, I mean... I have no feelings about them whatsoever. Neither like nor dislike. I invented them. So they are, they, I, they are, you know... Just things I put together. But when you think about how they're going to be received, you know, Lyle is not is, is a character that one and his wife Chanel, are both characters that one can really dislike for their values. But at the same time, you can recognise sense of a few things of one's own world and thoughts there. Yeah. Or people yeah. one knows. Well, or, I think you know, Lyle and Chanel. Um, they, what they have done is that they, they articulate and um, aspire to the values of, of their new homeland, Australia, which are not, which are not um, boasted about, but which actually do make society um, tick. So, you know, instead of the much-wanted mateship, for instance, Lyle and Chanel do not see mateship. They see ruthless individualism. So they think, well, we better be ruthlessly individualistic because that is what Australia is. We are going to be Australian. We're going to be like this. Um, I mean, they don't see egalitarianism. They see... Um, you know, uh, ambition. They see wanting to get ahead of the next person. They see the absolute fetishization of real estate, as you mentioned. They see 
um, endless obsession with home renovation. They see uh, unbridled consumerism. So, you know, they are simply living out what is un unacknowledged but real. And they're using the slogans of advertising to reinforce the naturalness, in a way, yeah. of a very unnatural situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Chanel, I mean, just uh, looking at her as a woman, uh, she, you know, you compare her to Lily, and uh, her attempts to be a successful professional Australian woman is a very distorting mm. exercise, isn't it? It's contorting, it's almost mutilating. Yeah, yeah. But she, I mean, she works for a big multinational, um, we can guess, mining company uh, called The Corporation. And that, so, you know, that kind of um, ruthlessness is absolutely expected of her at work. So now you've written this, this, this novel, mm -hmm. Michelle, and... <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's had a lot of accolades. It's been very well, it's been very provocative. And, you know, how far can you push the form? I think I have pushed as far as personally I can do it. I think I would just write a nice, slim romance next. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I mean, someone else will come along and do something, something else, take this further. But I think... Um, you know, I, I, I can't go anywhere else with this. I think I've taken, you know, the idea of the broken book, the discontinuous novel, as far as I can take it. I mean, um, one of the things I sort of liked was that it's a, a, a definition of a monster uh, is, you know, we call something, something a monster when it deviates from the norm. So this book is kind of a scary monster too. It's, it's deviates from the norm. It's not what you would expect uh, in a book. Although there are some other books that use this format. Um, uh, Ali Smith? Oh, not exactly. Ali Smith's novel, You Don't Go Like That, it just, she has the two different print runs. She had a novel, she had half, a, a, a narrative set in the past and a narrative set in the present. And they just split the print run. Oh, so, okay. yes, that's true. you know, um, it's just random. You buy a book and you might start with the um, past narrative or you might start with the contemporary one. So they didn't, she didn't do the um, flip format. Um, but Carol Shields, an, um, a Canadian writer, uh, I learned, the moment you do this, people start telling you about, you know, other examples they've found. Um, in a sort of, ah, gotcha, way, <laughs> you know. Um, which I still haven't read the Carol Shields, but I did the modern thing and Googled it instead. <laughs> um, why bother read it? Just Google. Well, um, as is library. Except shows, for my book, of course. We, do, um, we don't have too many books out there anymore. Yeah. In fact, none. <laughs> Um, but so she, um, her novel is called Happenstance. Um, this is from sort of early 90s. And it's a story of a marriage told from the point of view of the wife in one half, from the point of view of the husband in the other, um, which I think is, you know, fantastic. Uh, but with all due respect to Carol Shields, I think, um, you know, there is, uh, you know, the idea of a novel being told from, you know, events told from a different points of view is not a new one. Um, you know, you think of well, anything really, but uh, yeah, Faulkner, as I lay dying, for instance. Um, but, you know, there is unity of tone and style and so on. So I think I did something different and original with changing. It, it's not just the break in, in narrative, and there is a narrative bridge. I mean, this is something we didn't mention, but um, there is a possible narrative, con a connection between the two narratives, but the reader must decide whether or not it is a real connection. Um, but apart from the narrative discontinuity, there is just the difference in tone, voice, style. So, yeah. Um, I, I think 
um, even if I had known about uh, happenstance, I would have felt okay about doing this. And yeah, Carol it's... Shields is probably saying, God, I wish I had Michelle's editor and Michelle's <laughs> publisher. <laughs> but, yeah. But, you know, Alice, someone like Alice Smith, certainly, I think the success of that novel, um, which, you know, um, was this sort of uh, split print run, meant that marketing departments were sort of more willing to to risk it with this book. Well, bravo for being so risky and uh, <laughs> brave and writing such a brilliant novel. Oh, thank you very thank much. You so much, Michelle. No, thank you. I go. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.